Hi, today we're talking about power in this shop, but also in your shop. We're gonna cover three phase, cable types, connectors, utility service, and beyond. Let's go. Now, electrical is something we all have to deal with. And this video is about how I did, and you can add the power that you need and save money in the process. And the truth of the matter is, sometimes we buy a tool because it's what we have the power for, and sometimes we have the power so we can buy the bigger tool. So you see it can be a chicken and the egg kind of problem, and the cost of electrical is something we don't typically account for when we're counting our pennies to decide which tool to buy. Now, before I dive in, this is one of those topics that you can talk for hours about and really not get through it fully. Now, I'm gonna show you one way of doing it, and that's my way of doing it. But in the description of the, the video, I'll go ahead and break down additional details about all the topics surrounding it, and if you have more questions than that, you can go ahead and leave me a comment, and I'll do my best to answer it. Stick around until the end of the video, and I'll break down all the parts, vendors, and costs associated with this build-out you're seeing today. I think I've struck a good balance between cost and flexibility. And it all starts with the idea of using cords over fixed drops. The traditional way to wire your shop is to add fixed circuits at various points in your shop. So you take your best guess at the amperage and the voltages that you're gonna need, and you add drops at various intervals to facilitate the tools you have. But most of us start out with a mobile shop and we move tools around. Where we put the drop can actually determine where the tool can go or if we need to move it further than it will reach, we end up adding a cord anyway. Here's a few picks from when my shop was mobile. I would roll the tools out and I would move them around depending on the type of project I was doing. But don't take my word for it. Here are five key reasons to use cords over fixed drops. First, equipment changes and with that power changes. Suddenly your 120 volt bandsaw needs a 240 volt connection. Second, equipment moves. And while we've already touched on this, the point is that whether you're moving tools for workspace or you're moving tools to reconfigure your shop, it does move. Third, the cost is comparable, at least until you add the labor. Electricians are expensive, and it's much more expensive for an electrician to run a 30-foot drop than a 3-foot drop. Extension cords you can make yourself, and with a fixed drop, if you have to change it, you're gonna pay twice. Fourth, you can easily retool cords. You can change the ends, you can have extra length and just coil it up at the tool so that if you move the tool, you have the extra length already built in. And you can even have extra conductors in the cable so that if you go from a 120-volt tool to a 240-volt tool, you can use the exact same cable, change the ends, and make use of the extra conductor. And five, it's easy. They're easy to make, they're easy to buy, they're easy to run, doesn't require a lot of planning, and who doesn't like easy? I locate all of my outlets in the same stud cavity as my breaker panel, so I don't have to drill through any studs, it's easy to fish new wires in, or if you're having your electrician install your drops, it's really easy for them to add multiple drops quickly, and that equates to money savings. All right, let's switch gears and talk about the difference between one and three phase. Now it's simpler than you would think. Single phase comes in 120 and 240 volt, but it comes from a single AC circuit. And three phase comes from three separate AC circuits. So why is three phase better for woodworking? Well, it's not always better, but it is better for large equipment and large motors. In practical terms, it's just more efficient. And without getting too deep into this, you can see that single phase motors have two contact points creating an alternating magnetic field. And three phase motors have overlapping fields. This means it's easier to start and run the motor. So three phase power is usually only available in commercial spaces, but it can be yours. You have a few options. So the first option is a VFD or a variable frequency drive. Now this is ideal for a single tool that requires three phase power. Now many tools already come integrated with VFDs. My Harvey G800 has a VFD and takes single phase power and converts it to three phase. So VFDs are very effective, but as the amperage goes up, so does the cost. Now if you have more or plan on having more tools that need three phase power, there are better options. You can install a three phase sub panel. This is my three phase sub panel and it gives me up to four three phase circuits. And it works like any other sub panel, except instead of being powered by a utility service, it's powered by a phase converter. 
There are two popular options for phase converters. You can get a rotary phase converter or you can get a solid state. A rotary phase converter works like this. The motor is powered via single phase power and it outputs three phase power. These work very well and they're very cost effective, but they are a little bit loud. Well, at least louder than the alternatives. Phase Perfect is what I went with. It's a solid state phase converter and it works extremely well. It's designed to never need service and it's outdoor rated, but like VFDs, it produces a high pitch whine, and that can be quite jarring if you're not expecting it. So pick your poison. Now both types of phase converters install pretty much the same way. You're gonna hardwire them into your panel. Now I've used flex duct to route the cable from my panel to my phase perfect. Now it's not what I'd call the prettiest, at least not right now, but if I want to, I can reconfigure it pretty easily and I don't have to open up any walls to go through and clean it up. So we have our panel, we have our sub panel, and we're ready for outlets. There are two categories to look at in the US, NEMA and IEC, specifically IEC pin and sleeve. NEMA is what you're gonna find in your house, it's what you're gonna be familiar with. It comes in a wide variety of configurations and you can easily find it at your local home center or your local electrical supplier. IEC, on the other hand, are harder to come across, but I've started favoring them. First, it's important to note that it's very hard to find high amperage NEMA connectors. Once you get over 50 amps, good luck. But it's not just that. The IEC connectors I'm using are twist lock and they're water resistant. They're perfect for a wood shop. I found the NEMA twist locks to be so-so, especially if your cables move at all, they tend to come loose or not stay fully locked. IEC connectors also come at a premium, but there are ways to save and I'll come back to that. There's also nothing preventing you from mixing and matching NEMA and IEC connectors together. For several tools I'm using, I have NEMA connectors at the wall and IEC connectors at the tool. Now we come to the cable and this one's pretty simple. I switched to only using SOOW or SJOOW cabling. Now I didn't throw out my old existing cords, but I'm slowly switching everything over. So SJ who, uh, yeah, the name is not that important. It's just a code that indicates the capabilities of the cable. In this case, it's oil resistant and weather and water resistant. But the point is the cable is really durable, whether it's on the floor or up on the ceiling. The former is rated at 600 volts and the latter at 300 volts, but both are fine for your applications. The good news is you can buy this cable anywhere and you can find lots of good deals to bring the cost down. You can buy it by the reel, you can buy it by the foot. I tend to buy longer cables for future flexibility. And it comes in any conductor configuration you'd like. Now I typically buy four wire, which works for both single and three phase power. Now let's talk about the availability of power on your panel and mine. There are two reasons that you would upgrade your panel or your utility service. There's either no room in your panel or your service is too small. You can use your meter to check the actual draw from your service during peak load, air conditioners or any other major appliances running. And you can use that same meter to check individual tools in your shop to see what their actual draw is going to be. Now, if you have plenty of power, but no room in the panel, you have the option to rotate out full breakers for slimline breakers. This will free up some space and could be a great stopgap option. You also have the option to just add a sub panel. The benefit is that with the sub panel, it doesn't have to be next to your main panel. It can be on the far side of your shop, or if your main panel isn't even in your garage, it's a great way to have a home base for the circuits in your garage. If you want or need to upgrade your service, it's quite a big topic and I didn't cover it in this video, but I'm gonna leave quite a bit of information in the description below to get you started. Now I did upgrade my service and I saved a lot of money doing the work myself. If you have underground service, it's also a great excuse to rent a backhoe and tear up your yard. Fun could be had. So when I did my service upgrade, I didn't want to replace my existing panel. So I just added a second 200 amp panel of the same make and model, and I used the same breakers. It was a huge cost saver. I also added this fuse disconnect. So if I wanted to shut off the power to do any electrical work, it was easy and safe. I haven't used it, but it's there if I want it. And it looks pretty cool. So this strategy maximizes your ability to relocate tools, save money, do it yourself, and minimize your need for expensive electricians. Also, you don't have to do any long-term planning. Your specific codes may limit what you can do with your panel or your service, but not the cords and cables that you attach to it. And I've got another video about getting those cables up and off the ground and onto the ceiling. It should be in, oh, hey guys. Ooh. 
So let's talk about sourcing parts. First, your electrical supplier is always gonna be better than your home store. So when you need parts, call around and ask. They'll usually sell to individuals, they're usually happy to help you, and you can meet some interesting people there, electricians and other tradesmen on site. When it comes to panels, breakers, disconnects, and connectors, I try to buy new old stock or find deals. eBay is a great place to look. My main panel, my breakers, my fuses, my disconnects, they were all new old stock and I paid a fraction of the new costs and they were otherwise brand new. My IEC connectors are almost all purchased used. They're commonly pulled out of industrial installations and sold for scrap, but they're in great condition at a fraction of the cost. They're so well built, there's no problem using used components. Finally, I usually buy my cable online by the foot, but it's fairly cheap even at your home center or from your electrical supplier. Let's talk about electricians. Here are my tips. If it's a smaller job, I hire a pair of electricians and pay by the hour. I find that a pair of electricians works faster than two individual electricians. But if it's a large job, like wiring my main panel, or upgrading my service, or installing my disconnect, I shop it around. But I'm only talking to master electricians. The guy I chose to do my work gave me the best vibe. He was responsive and he had a reasonable price. He came with four additional electricians and they were done in four hours. All right, as promised, here's the breakdown of the cost for this shop. And just a reminder, if you're looking for more info, I've loaded up the description with more details. I mean, I, I hope I did, at least. I, not, I mean, I'm recording right now, but goodbye.